founder and executive director of Jack's Caregiver Coalition, where our mission is to improve the way that guys think, feel, and act in their role as a cancer caregiver. Thank you for helping us shine a light today on Mr. Mark Matson. Mark is a humble guy with a huge heart, a guy that inspires me because when his journey became overwhelming, he had the courage to reach out and ask for help. Jack's message was simple. Serve the caregiver, he said. They're always forgotten. A message I just happen to be the first person to receive. We're here to serve you, they said, and they were looking at me. That moment, those words, hit me like lightning and changed me forever. Today, we're proud that Jax has served hundreds of cancer caregivers and that 97% of those we've surveyed believe that we contributed to their sense of improvement as a caregiver. The accomplishments we're proudest of, though, are the stories, the stories of the caregivers connecting through our programs, how they've shown up for each other in inspiring and intangible ways, lending an ear during an intensely uncertain and isolating time, joining each other's caregiving teams, providing solace when it's needed most during frightening hospital stays, and providing community long after their caregiving journey is over, be it through remission of the disease or through the loss of life. These are the stories that are the purpose of this campaign. Stories that with your help, we can create more of. For most guys, caring for a loved one with cancer is a world of relentless uncertainty and isolation. Two things we've all had a taste of in this new era of COVID-19. Two things that breed fear, anxiety, exhaustion, and depression. Two things that cause many guys to isolate themselves even further, rather than reaching out, because they were taught that reaching out is a sign of weakness. But we imagine a very different future for guys who are caregivers. A future that you can help us make a reality. The community that we imagine will ensure someday that every caregiver experiences renewal and solace every single day. A community that will inspire and equip every caregiver to face their challenges boldly, with energy, with enthusiasm, and with confidence. A community that will someday give an entire team of highly equipped caregivers to everyone facing catastrophic illness. In closing, I want to express our gratitude for our campaign host, Rich Anderson, for our producer, Chris Cloutier, for the support of Randy Lee, and of course, today's honoree, Mark Matson, for all their support in making today's broadcast a reality. And on behalf of everyone at Jax, we want to thank you for considering helping us make 14 more stories like Mark's a reality. Hi, I'm Randy Lee. I began attending the Jax Caregiver Clatches in February 2019, a little over two years after my wife Brenda had passed away from bile duct cancer. The Clatches provide a space for active and former caregivers to voice the fears frustrations, joys, and blessings that come from caring for someone with an illness like cancer. The clashes give caregivers the opportunity to see that they're not alone. The experience you share with your loved one during treatment is uniquely yours, but the situations and issues that come up are often common across many treatments. Maybe the way someone else handled something will inspire you. Maybe you'll just get to vent about something that's not solvable. I did not know about Jax during Brenda's treatment. I think my caregiving of Brenda was pretty good, but I also think it should have been better for both of us if I attended the Jax activities and clashes during that time. Because of the value I see Jax providing active and former caregivers, I became a monthly donor this year. I hope you will also donate so Jack can continue its mission. Thanks. Hey everybody, my name is Rich Anderson, and I am your host for the fourth episode of Shine the Light. 
This is the Jack's Caregiver Coalition presentation, and I am very honored to be your host. We've got a great guest today. Mark will be joining me shortly, and we've got two more guests coming up next week. I'll tell you more about them as we get a little bit closer. But let me just tell you a little bit about myself so you know who it is that's hosting this presentation. So again, Rich Anderson, and I am not only uh, your host, but I am also a Jack. That means that I am caring for a loved one going through cancer. Uh, my wife has had colon cancer for five years, um, and she is living with cancer and doing well. Uh, but it isn't hasn't always been that way. The journey has been very challenging along the way, and there are times when um, I would have really struggled more than I did if it weren't for the love and care that I received from friends, family, and organizations like Jack's. And so this this particular shine the light concept was something that uh, I was really passionate about. Um, I also am a board member of uh, Jack's Caregiver Coalition. And as we were talking about what we needed to do in 2020, uh, one of the things we wanted to do is highlight the success stories. Um, we talk about how caregivers are really the behind the scenes superheroes in the cancer journey. Clearly, the, the person going through cancer is, is a superhero in of their own, right? But when that person uh, is going through cancer, everybody always asks, how are they doing? And what can I do to help them? Uh, the caregiver is this forgotten soul behind the scenes. And we really want to highlight that person. If they are taken care of, they are more prepared and capable of taking care of their loved ones. And so it is with a, a great honor and pleasure that I get to be your host for three more episodes. Um, this one being episode number four with Mr. Mark Matson, And uh, I will cue our wonderful producer, Chris, to, to bring Mark on in here so we can get to know Mark a little bit. Mark, welcome to the Shine the Light Show. How are you doing, bud? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me, Rich. You know, it's uh, it's one of those shows that um, we probably didn't want to be on <laughs> because yeah. that meant that we had to go through a heck of a journey to get here. But But since we didn't choose that, at least we get to hang out with some pretty cool people, right? I couldn't agree more. Yeah, that's just, just like I've told people at some of the Jacks events that very same thing. It's like, you know what? I'm glad you're here. This is a club that nobody wants to be a part of, but you know what? You, you found the right people to, to to help you with your journey. It's your favorite club. You wouldn't have chosen if given the choice, but exactly. Um, now you've you've been in Jacks for a year. I've been part of Jacks now for I think around three years. I, I guess I should ask Kyle when I first started, but it's been several, and I and I believe. Uh, you and I went to um, the same event that was your very first event. Do you remember what that one was? Yeah, the uh, the go kart racing. Yeah, the go kart yeah. racing. I yeah. uh, I hadn't done that high speed go kart racing before. That was phenomenal. You, do you, like how did you do? Do you even remember like <laughs> like where you came in? Or it probably didn't matter, right? I don't. I, you know, I don't even remember where I finished in all of those different heats. I know sometimes I think I was probably doing well, and other times I got stuck behind some slow cars and. <laughs> you know. I just remember that Alan couldn't get around the corner more That's than like right, three yeah, in a yeah. row, and, yeah. and then he would create a traffic jam. It was hilarious. Yeah. But, well, before we get into knowing you, Mark, and, and hearing about Terry and your kids, uh, I just want to remind everybody that we are trying to raise money for the Jacks Caregiver Coalition. Uh, folks like Mark and myself and many other Jacks, um, they, they really need some help. And what you're going to find out when you hear about Mark's story is that when we can fund an organization like this, and provide opportunities for Mark and I and others to hang out and help each other, support each other, love each other. Um, it makes it that much easier for us to get through the job of being a caregiver, and it's not an easy job. Our goal for this, this uh, fundraising campaign over the next week is to raise over $10,000. So that $10,000 will support another 14 jacks through the journey for a year costs approximately $750 per year to support the activities, the go-kart racing, the happy hour, whatever it is, and create those opportunities. And we'd like to create 14 more opportunities. So there's the link. You'll see it on the screen, um, jackscaregiverco.org slash shine the light. We'd love it if you could come donate, whether it's a dollar, $10, $100, $1,000, whatever, whatever you can support would be awesome. Mark, uh, let's take five minutes. And just get everyone up to speed as to your caregiving journey. Now, I know that Terry was diagnosed several years ago, but the bar got raised about a year ago. 
and, yep. and, and it moved rather quickly. Give us the high level uh, part of that journey, you know, and, and your wife's diagnosis, obviously the outcome, um, and, and get us up to uh, today. Yep, sure thing. Um, so Terry was diagnosed with um, stage three uh, invasive ductal carcinoma breast cancer. Um, it was uh, triple negative breast cancer is kind of the technical is what the uh, diagnosis of it. That was in April of 2018. Mm. And right away, the very first thing she said was, okay, well, let's, let's attack this. How do we, you know, what, what's the next step? You know, I was, even before we had met with the oncologist, she was already like, you know, figuring out what are the steps I need to do to, 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 to defeat this and, um, you know, move on and, 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 you know, live my life to the best that I can. So right from the get go, she was very determined, um, strong willed wanting to, uh, to defeat this. And, you know, we met with a couple of oncologists at a couple of different clinics, you know, kind of, you know, for lack of a better word, kind of shopping around trying to find the right oncologist in the hospital system that, that, you know, made us feel, you know, the most, you know, comfortable. And I'm fortunate enough that one of my neighbors works in the uh, Alina hospital system. So he was one of the first or second phone calls Terry made once she got the diagnosis after we had met with an uh, oncologist in a different hospital system who just didn't have a good, you know, just didn't like their, their, their approach and how yeah. he done started. And, you know, Terry wanted to get started the next day and they were pushing the, that first visit a couple of weeks out. So she made a call to, uh, to our neighbor, Stephen, and, he said, give me 10 minutes, and he did his magic, and about 15 minutes later, he says, call this office and ask for any one of these three oncologists, and we did wow. that, and within a couple of days, we were meeting with the oncologist and getting together a plan of how we're going to attack this. That's, so that was, that That's was, amazing. That Let was me pause good. you there for just a second. Yeah. Um, during this time, I remember... Uh, being just overwhelmed with the the new words, right? Mm -hmm. you know, metastatic, and you know, you just used a couple when you when you described Terry's <laughs> diagnosis and and stage yeah. two, stage three, stage four. I mean, I didn't know how many stages there were no. at the time. Yeah. Isn't it a little bit crazy how naive we were, or how uninformed we were in the ways yeah. of cancer? And now you can throw around terms like that to people like me. Yeah. And I, I get what you mean. You just said that. And I'm like, I don't know exactly because my wife's diagnosis was different, but I mm -hmm. picked up a lot of that. Yeah. That's one of the challenges as we're going through the caregiver journey, right? Because who do you have that conversation with and use any of those words? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and have them understand, you know, have the understood. severity of some of those words. Exactly. Yep. So, so you so you found a new oncologist, thankfully through your friend, Stephen, or your neighbor, Stephen, yep. who, was, who was Johnny on the spot and helped out. Yep. How, did, how did that next part of the journey go? It went really well. I mean, our oncologist, she was same mentality as, as what, you know, Terry and I had, like, let's attack this hard. Let's attack it fast. Let's get up going right away. We don't want to, we don't want to wait and prolong nearly the whole process. So, you know, we met with her a few times. They did, you know, scans and tests and got a good idea of, of what it is they're working with. And then they developed the, uh, the treatment plan. And her treatment plan was, you know, uh, chemo first, a um, couple of different rounds of, of chemo over the course of 18 or 20 weeks, I think it was. Yeah. And then they did surgery and uh, radiation after that. So it yeah. was, it was a very rather compact, you know, beginning to that, that process. And that, I mean, things were happening very quickly every week, every other week, she was going in for, for this treatment and that treatment and, mm -hmm. and getting things done. And yeah, I mean, like you said, Bridge, just getting thrown into a whole, you know, brand new world of, you know, terminology and words and procedures that, you know, if you're not, in this the cancer you know journey yourself either as a caregiver or as someone going through it you know you can try to explain that what's going on but you know people who have never seen that or never heard of those words they don't quite you know understand what some of it means well full fox and full fury and infusion and ports yeah. and, and yeah. even the word oncologist what does that all include like it, yeah. it's a little overwhelming so so we did the chemo we did the radiation we did the surgery um at that point uh, well, let me let me back up. Mm -hmm. 
did you have help during that time, you know, going to the chemo, going to the radiation, driving to the appointments, or was this all, you know, Mark? We did, no, but I, I was very fortunate and blessed to have a very, very strong and big support network behind us with the, this whole journey, right? Right from the, you know, the very first phone call, like I said, you know, I called our friend Steve, and, and I mean, right there, that was the beginning of the support group behind us, and it, it only grew exponentially from there. And we had so many people calling and asking, what can they do to help? You know, can they make meals? You know, I'm going grocery shopping, need me to pick you up anything. You know, here, let me, I'll, I'll mow your lawn for you this week. You know, just... It was overwhelming in the, the support that, that I had. And, you know, it's funny you asked about, you know, people, you know, you know, or, or was it just, you know, me taking her to oncology visits or do other people want to go? It was amazing how many of her friends wanted to go sit with her for half a day, you know, when she had her infusion. And it was almost when I was like, you know, I only need one person to come with me and I have four people that want to take me this week. <laughs> All right. Yeah, no, it's, that's great. And, and I will say that you're a little bit of an anomaly as I've, as I've had these interviews, uh, hosted these sessions, and even talked to several other Jacks, many of them, um, they, they were offered help, but many of them didn't yeah. accept the help as quickly as they wish they had. And so okay. if you accepted that help earlier, um, a little bit of a unicorn. I see you got a unicorn over your shoulder there, but you're a little bit of a yeah. unicorn. In well, we'll actually that story later. Okay, good. Um, but you're a little bit of a unicorn in just accepting the help. And so kudos yeah. to you. I, I hope that's a lesson you can pass on to other Jacks and other caregivers as you go. So well, let's go back and, and, and try to get us there. So we yeah. went through the chemo radiation surgery. Now what? Yeah, yeah. And so that whole process, I mean, it took a good chunk of, you know, almost a year from you know beginning to the when she was recovered from surgery um she was you know a phenomenal you know fighter she was very strong you know she obviously she had you know her her bad days you know a couple of days after she had that infusion you know she had her she was just you know you know that chemo you know just kicked her to the ground and she was sick and noxious and didn't want to eat anything and didn't want to move but it was kind of nice in that when her day of infusion was it fell on a tuesday her bad day was always on a friday so okay. she just missed one day of work you know for friday when she felt you know horrible oh wow she, she worked through all weekend all work. she, she worked through it all yeah so you know she had the weekend to recover and by you know by saturday night sunday morning she was feeling more or less you know back to herself again and wow. then she'd you know go back in that tuesday for chemo and feel fine and slowly kind of you know fall down and then the end of the week hit and that was her bad day and so yeah, she was, you know, a, a lot of credit to her. I mean, she she fought hard and she worked hard through through that whole process. Wow, continued to that's, work. So. That's amazing. That, yeah. I mean, having gone through rounds of chemo, radiation, surgery, um, I I can't even imagine that. I mean, there's definitely times when my wife did work and could work. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of times when I was glad she didn't have to. Yeah. Um. So okay. So. We went back to work, we did the chemo, we did the radiation, so now uh, where are we in the timeline and, and what's next? So yeah, we're kind of in the timeline. So she was diagnosed, as I said, in, in April of 2018. Um, that kind of consumed, you know, obviously all spring, summer, and, and into the fall. Okay. Um, her surgery was, you know, scheduled and was con was done on, on October 1st of 2018. So, you know, it's about, what's that date? So we have about a six month time span from basically straight chemo um, a little time to recover, and then they did the surgery, and then, you know, a couple of weeks after surgery, you know, she recovered enough to start the radiation treatment, and, you know, she did radiation, you know, in the fall, um, and really, that was done by probably towards, you know, in, in November, right around Thanksgiving, I think it was, you know, the radiation was done, so she really handled that whole process, I think, fairly well. I mean, you know, she had her ups and downs like you would expect, but by, you know, right around Christmas time of, of 2018 and beginning of 2019, she was really strong. I mean, she yeah. was really more or less, you know, getting used to, you know, living, you know, as a, you know, someone who's, you know, cancer was in remission. Everything was, was good. At the diagnosis, so it was good. All the scans were coming back clean, um, feeling really optimistic. So, hey, you know what? It looks like, you know, we got this thing beat. You know, we're, we're, we're good. Let's, let's start moving forward with, with our new lives. And, yeah. You know, it def definitely opens up your eyes to some things. I mean, you, you, we started talking about, okay, what are the things that, you know, now that Terry's getting better, getting stronger, those you know, things we've talked about that we've always kind of put off for whatever reason, you know, 
you know, is it, you know, if we have the time off work, kids' schedule is busy, you know, could we, you know, could we afford it? Could we not afford that in the budget? It's like, let's start making some of these plans and doing some of those things because it really is that eye opening, you know, kind of kick in the head that says, saying, you know what, you know, life can be short sometimes. And if you don't, if you don't take advantage of doing something now, you know, putting it off, you might never get to it. Well, I, I agree. And I, I want to pause you there for a second because there's a couple of concepts that you, you, you brought up. Um, one is the concept of time. And I think before cancer, I would think in terms of months, quarters, years, you know, what are we going to do next summer? What are we going to do for Christmas? What are we going to do that? Um, after cancer, uh, and people would say, how's it going? My answers would, would go significantly shorter. They would go, it's been a really good day today. Yeah. Right. Ask yeah. me again tomorrow. Right. But I became far more in tune with the present and appreciative of the present. If we have a, a good day, we celebrated. If we had a tough day, you know, we got mm -hmm. through it together. Did you notice that as well? I did. Yep. You're right. There, you definitely take things on a much shorter time time frame. You, know, you 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 take things day by day, your week by week. You know, you have to, you know, like I said, this was a good day. This was a good week. Yep. Yeah. You know, in, in some ways, it, it makes when you have those those little you know step backs and you have a bad day or a bad week, it makes it harder because they're like, oh man, you know, I, I felt really good for the last you know three weeks, and now you know I got I got a cold, and now I feel miserable, and I just can't seem to beat this cold. But normally, it takes two days to get over that cold. Now it takes two weeks to get over that cold, and just it, yeah. it, you know the highs feel higher and sometimes, the lows feel lower. Well, and and there's my second concept, and it's that of the roller coaster. If I were okay. to if I were to graph my emotions over the journey, there were definitely some highs and lows. Mm -hmm. My guess, if I were to graph yours, um, you know, obviously it was it was down initially, and then we we, we thought it was treatable, so it, it probably got a little optimistic. And then chemo started, and it probably went down, and and then we got done with chemo, and it, you know, so it went down and up and down and up, and and, and right now you're probably on the way up because yeah. chemo done, radiation's done, surgery's done, and we're feeling better, maybe not yeah. optimistic yet, but at least, you, you know, the, the roller coaster is going this trajectory. Um, my guess is that at some point in the next part of your story, the roller coaster changes. Yes, it, uh, it definitely changes in, in a big way. So, you know, beginning of, you know, 2019, like I said, you know, all winter was going good, spring was going good. And then right around, uh, probably around May of 2019, um, Terry started having, you know, some back pains, you know, lower back pains. And, you know, she had, you know, she'd been having a lot of, you know, her, you know, PET scans and CT scans and everything has been coming back looking good and looking clean. So, you know, cancer coming back never really kind of entered our mind. Everything looked good. And she, um, Terry worked at a middle school. She was a special ed para helping, you know, you know, you know, you know, kids that need extra attention and extra help that sometimes can be in a mainstream classroom, other times are in, you know, more of a kind of a one on one situation. So she spent a lot of time sitting in a lot of small, hard, uncomfortable wooden chairs in the middle school at times. So just assumed, OK, you know, just that's what the back pain is from, you know, sore back from sitting in a small chair and that's not meant for 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 an adult. Um, you know, and it just it kept getting worse and worse as, you know, the days and the weeks went on, kind of, like I said, getting back to that, you know, living things by, you know, by the day, by the week, you know, kind of a mentality. More and more days were harder. She was having a hard time, you know, just, you know, functioning some days, you know, you know, Advil and hot pads would uh, would work on the back things. Other times it wouldn't. And then towards the beginning of June, the pain also started migrating up and she started having severe and debilitating headaches and they would only get worse and worse. And it got to the point where a few times, you know, there was just so bad after seeing, you know, specialists and, you know, PT, you know, therapists and um, just talking with anybody who, you know, could try and figure out what was going on. Still kind of thinking, okay, it was something, you know, muscular, skeletal issue kind of a thing that way. And the pain just worse, kept getting worse and worse, and eventually, you know, ended up in the hospital with, you know, the debil debilitating migraines. Well, if you've ever, ever gone to the ER, you know, they always just try to treat whatever symptom you come in with. So we went in with 
you know, well, you know, migraines and headaches. Well, that's what the ER doctor focused on. You know, ran some tests, ran some things. Being a cancer patient, um, obviously that kind of elevates some of their concern with um, with what they're testing. But they ran some tests and, and did everything, and everything came back clean. They figured, okay, there must be some side effect with you know one of the medications that she was on. Treated her for some migraines, gave her some migraine drugs, and you know within an hour or two, everything was was good. You know, the headaches were gone, the migraines were good, and they discharged us. And thinking, okay, well maybe that's what it was. It was just bad migraines, and then. A couple, two, three days later, the symptoms all came back again and got bad enough where that following week, right back in the ER again. And that definitely, you know, raises some, you know, some more emotions and, and concerns with, okay, well, we're back here again with the same symptoms. So, so something else is, is going on. Well, so let me pause you there. Yep. Because um, I want to make sure we're shining the light on you and the people that were helping you. So, so during this part of the journey, the roller coaster definitely is is it's in a it's in a tough place, right? Whether yeah. it's going down or if it's doing, you know, back and forth or whatever, you, you you've got to be bouncing off the walls emotionally. Oh yeah. How, how did you get through some of this time? Who in your life um, helped you? What 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 you know? Are you a runner? Did you bike? You know, how did you blow off steam? Talk talk to me about that. Yeah, I guess it's hard to really, you know, I guess answer that. I mean, I, you know, I had some hobbies and activities, um, but I was just so focused, I think, on, you know, taking care of Terry, being that caregiver, um, that that's really where I kind of put all of my energy and effort in. Um, yeah. you know, the support group behind me, like I said, I was blessed with them. You know, my parents would take my kids for a few days. And, you know, neighbors would come take the kids during the day and have them play with their friends. Um, you know, like I said, you know, people bring over meals. You know, I I had freezer full of meals sometimes where somebody bring over a meal. It's like, I, I don't have anywhere to put it, but, you know, thank <laughs> you very much problem. for that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it was like, so I was like, you know, and that, that was just so helpful because, you know, there was so much time that, you know, I'd spent at the hospital with Terry, with doctors. Um, I will still, you're right, trying, trying to work as much as I can, trying to take care of what needs to be taken down around the house. You know, you know I, I think I focused all of my effort on, you know, that, that job, taking care of, taking care of Terry being, being that caregiver. And I was, you know, again, I said, I was blessed to have the support group behind me that I, I could focus 95% of my energy on, on, on taking care of, of Terry and, and being with Terry. And, you know, knowing my kids were in good hands with friends, family, you know, and, and they're they're old enough, you know, they were two in high school and in middle school, so they're old enough to be home by themselves and fairly self sufficient as well. But yeah, just you know, the amount of people that, that stepped up and, and helped during that whole that whole journey definitely made it easier for me to to, to, to be the, the caregiver. That's great. And and you mentioned your kids, you have two daughters and one son, is that right? Yeah, two daughters and a son, yes. Yeah, and so I'm assuming they were they were also part of the caregiving team. Um, did they have specific roles that they resonated with, or were they, you know, Terry's happy time when she got the yep. <laughs> the kids? You know, what, how did how did they uh, how did they participate? Yeah, they I mean they they helped out around the house doing some chores, and you're right. I think I think they helped out a lot, um, just you know emotionally. You know, you know Terry, you know, is a great mom. She loves her kids like every other mother does. Um, obviously, going through this journey is not something you want your kids to, to, to see if you can avoid it. But right. it was, um, I think, so helpful for her to have, you know, to have the kids stop by when she was in the hospital or to, you know, come visit her when she was, you know, kind of bedridden with, with, with the pain. Yeah. Being able to see that, you know, see her kids and spend time with her kids. And it, it, it didn't matter if they were just, you know, sitting there on the bed talking or if she was out on the couch watching a movie, just... You know, being around her kids definitely, um, definitely, you know, helped bring her spirits up, helped her, her in that regard. Well, that's great. Well, let me, um, let me remind folks that that we are trying to raise some funds here, and, and when we come back here, Mark, yeah. um, I'd like to, I'd like to hear how the, the unfortunate part of the journey played out, um, and get you to kind of current time, so that we can mm -hmm. talk about, um, you know, the the new normal, if that is a term that we can use. Yeah. Uh, but just to remind folks, you know, we're, we're we're trying to raise some funds here. We're calling it Shine the Light. We're shining the light on people like Mark, on people like Stephen, on, on his children. Um, 
and anybody who helped mow the lawn, get groceries, uh, cook food, or, or volunteer to sit in the chemo or radiation rooms with our loved ones. Uh, caregivers have a fairly thankless journey and we're happy to do it because we know that they would do it for us, uh, but the reality is, is we need help. Uh, and there are jacks out there that report that they didn't get any help during their caregiving journey. And I, and I called Mark a unicorn earlier. Uh, when Jacks polled the caregivers and asked how many of you received care during your caregiving journey, a significant majority, I'm sure Kyle will give us the actual number, but it's 70, 80%, it's, it's a big number, reported yeah. that they received no care on their caregiving journey. And we want to help them. We want to give them a place where they can come hang out with other Jacks and just know that they get it, that they can just be themselves, they can cry if they want, they can laugh, they can crash their go-kart into a wheel, it doesn't <laughs> matter. Uh, I've done ax throwing, mini golfing, regular golfing, uh, done the go-karts, I've done so many events, and every time I end up hooking up with someone like Mark, hearing their story, getting hugs from complete strangers, maybe not during COVID, but probably, uh, and it's, it's just a unique, opportunity. So for those of you listening, if you want to help folks like Mark, you can definitely deliver some lasagna to his freezer, or you can mow his lawn, or you can help support Jack's Caregiver by going to jackscaregiverco.org slash shine the light and, and just donate some funds. All right. So Mark, with that, let's come back and, and get see if we can get to the present time. So tell yeah. us about this uh, this last part of the journey. Obviously, not not the bright part, but it is what it is. So how did that play out and, and how did we get to the, the end of that part of the journey? Yeah, sure thing. Um, so yeah, after you know, a few weeks in and out of the ER and you know, weeks in the hospital and numerous, numerous tests that you know, they ran on Terry, um, you know, your brain starts going more and more back to that, that dark place of, is this cancer? Did it come back? Um, and sure enough, you know, they, they ran some, they did a, a, a spinal tap, pulled some spinal fluid out, and that's where they had found that um, the cancer came back and metastasized um, in her spinal fluid. Mm. So that would that was the cause of, of her back pains and, and her headaches. You know, she had the cancer floating around within her spinal fluid. Yeah. And, and, you know, that type of... Um, you know, cancer coming back that way really limits the treatment options. Um, and even just, you know, the, you know, the survival, the survivability of, of that, that cancer. It's, we knew when the oncologist came in after they had ran the tests, um, actually, you know, back, you know, thinking back on that day, my daughters had come to visit Terry in the hospital room and they were actually in the room when the oncologist walks in. And Terry and I both could see in his eyes, he didn't even have to say anything, that it wasn't good. And then he asked, you know, if the girls would mind stepping into the hall. And I think Terry and I both looked at each other, our eyes welled up, and we knew that we got the, um, we were going to get the news we never wanted to get. Yeah. And that's when he said that it, it came back, it's in her spinal fluid, and there are really, limited options for treatment. And even with treatment, um, you know, you have three to six months at best. Well, and I, um, I know that some of the funds that Jax receives goes towards a blog program sponsored mm -hmm. by the AARP. I know that you recently did a blog with Mike and Gary. Uh, I read that and, and I know that the next uh, three months of this journey, um, you wished were a lot longer, but they weren't. Yeah. So, so let's let's just get through that part real quick. Um, we've got the absolutely terrible news. Uh, we know that we have a limited amount of, of time to live. Uh, mm -hmm. The blog reminded me that you used that time as best you could to capture memories and yeah. to spend time with the family. Um, I'm assuming you were still working during this time. Yep, yeah, I was. I was still working as much as I could. Um, you know, the company I worked for was was very understanding. Um, they were very flexible and allowed me to work from home as much as I could, the hospital as much as I could, um, and that was that was you know that was a blessing. I think I spent probably almost close to two months, you know, working as much as I could without stepping into the office. 
yeah, pretty amazing. I mean, we all now, yeah. you know, work from home now is, is like a common thing, but yep. in Europe, it really wasn't, was it? Yeah, no, yeah, so, it wasn't. So that is a blessing. You're right. And kudos to, to the people that you work with for supporting you there. Mm -hmm. um, so now when, when, did, uh, when did her passing uh, occur? Was it a month later, five months later? How long did that? Yeah, so we, we got the kind of official diagnosis right around um, the beginning of July. Okay. And so about a year know, we, ago. So yeah, so it's about it's so we're coming up on a year from the you know the diagnosis of that, and you know we fought hard as hard as we could, bought you know as much time as we could with the family, and um, towards the uh, you know second week of September, we kind of got or well, we kind of got the news that with the the treatment options that they had and kind of getting getting to the unicorn over my my shoulder there. Um, the way they only way they could really treat the cancer in her spinal fluid was to put a port in her scalp. So they actually cut into her scalp, um, put a port in the top of her head, and ran the tube down into her right ventricle. And that's where they withdrew spinal fluid and put in the chemo medication. It was just basically an injection. It it took longer to kind of prep the area than the actual infusion did. It just you know, a couple of minutes is really all it took for her chemo infusion. Wow. So that was, you know, after she got her port put in, you know, they shaved her head. So she had a little bump on her head. And I just can't remember if it was, you know, one of her friends or one of our kids or whatever. But they basically said, you know, it's kind of like a unicorn. And she just, she loved that. So, you know, one of her friends brought the unicorn, the little stuffed unicorn over to her. She, um, we were out shopping one day. Um, took my daughter to the Mall of America because she wanted to go shopping you know, with mom. So you know, I took the day off work and we went and just had a field day and you know, spent a lot of money at the Mall of America. And walking by one of those um, you know, little kind of you know novelty T-shirt kiosks right there in front said, he said, I don't care, I'm a unicorn. She had a picture of a unicorn. So we had to buy that T-shirt for her. So sure. that's that, that's the story of the unicorn back there. So we kind of kind of you know Terry was joking around that that she was a she was a unicorn now. But yeah, what so a, what a nice you know, memory. Every time your daughter, it is. every time she sees a unicorn from now to the rest of her life, she's gonna think of mom. So that, that that's right. So so we did that. Um, fought hard, you know. So that was you know basically you know July to uh, October. So that that's you know three months. We figure, yeah. I mean that that's kind of what treatment said they would buy us, and and, and that that's what it did. So you know the last couple of weeks of September, I mean, she was no longer able to receive treatment. You know, one, you can only inject so much chemo drug right into the brain before you start causing, you know, you know, adverse effects to, to the brain and the nervous system. And they were not seeing any decrease in the, the level of, of cancer cells in the spinal fluid. So it's one of the kind of those causes we're really at a point where we can't give you any more medicine. And even if we do, it's not going to really do any good. And her oncologist, you know, and us, we made that that tough call of, of you know, stopping the chemo treatments and moving to uh, to hospice. Yeah. And I thought, you know, getting that initial diagnosis that the cancer had come back and it was in her spinal fluid and she has, you know, three to six months at best to live. You know, as, as much of that was as, you know, a punch in the gut, you know, just, you know, devastating to feel knowing that you're at the end of, of the journey, knowing there's nothing else that can be done. It's like we've, you know, we, we fought as hard as we could. We, we put up one hell of a fight, but you know, we, we, we still were not able to, uh, to, to continue you know, with our lives together. Yeah, yeah so that was October 1st? It was October, October 1st of 2019 when, when she passed away. Mm -hmm. And it was, it, was it was pretty close after her birthday, is that right? It was, yeah. Her, her birthday is September fifth, so okay. you know, she was, you know, she was, you know, you know, she was home. We had you know, just a small, you know, small, you know, you know, group of friends and family over for her birthday. Just something very small, and intimate, um, yeah. just to, to kind of celebrate celebrate her birthday. And then after it was a couple of days after her birthday, when when she went into home hospice care, and, you know, we wanted to to have her at home. In one, knowing that she's only going to have you know a few days to weeks potentially you know left, you know we wanted her home as much as possible. Um, that way, you know, obviously, you know, the kids and I could be with her 
as much as we can, you know, all day long. Um, you know, family was over, you know, almost daily family and friends were over just you know, coming in, even for those short visits when, when she was well enough to have, have people come over. And, you know, it was one of the things that helped make the decision to stop with the treatments and move to hospice care was anybody who's ever had a loved one in hospice, especially coming out of, you know, from, you know, chemo treatments and, and cancer treatments, a lot of patients tend to get what they kind of call like a hospice bump where about a week after entering hospice, you know, they're no longer getting inject, injected with, you know, such toxic chemicals you know, where their body is just fighting that as well as a disease where, you know, Terry, all of a sudden after, you know, a few days, a week, week and a half, you know, you know, of, after stopping chemo, she really felt the best she had in a long time. Right, right. Just because she wasn't getting, you know, toxic chemicals injected into her, her, her system. Yeah. And that was, that was nice, you know, being able to take advantage of that time. You know, she was, you know, you know, able to sit up in bed, you know, talk, interact with a lot of people, you know, spend, you know, time with the kids. You know, they'd come and they'd plop right down in bed and they'd sit there, they'd, you know, read a book, tell a story, play a game, you know, just sit there and hang out and talk to mom as much as they can. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, well, fortunate enough that, you know, that lasted right up until just about when she passed. She was you know really good for probably I would say two weeks and then all of a sudden you could just see it you know things started shutting down you know you, you could just it, it's really hard to describe without you know seeing it yourself but you could just see the change coming and that was one of the things you know talking with the hospice nurses they said you'll know when the time is coming here and it was yeah you know and, you know, you can start seeing that coming and, you know, you call all the family over and, you know, they all come up and they're sitting, you know, sitting at the home, you know, at home, you know, coming up and talking with her and we're you know, letting her rest. And, you know, it was pr probably a couple of days from when you noticed the first of, you know, change that she started to, you know, really just her body started to shut down to, to when she passed. And you know, she passed away, you know, in the evening, you know, almost all of the family and friend or almost all the family were here a few people had left thinking okay you know what i might go home come back you know in the morning and it was tough and then you know you could just see she just woke up and kind of looked around and you could just kind of see you know as she took her last few breaths wow but yeah we were all standing around at the hospital bed here in, at home and you know telling her we loved her and, that's, you know, she can go when she's ready. And it's one of those things, you know, we talked about it earlier. You could have yeah. that same conversation with, you know, five other Jacks and they get it. They were there. They remember yeah. the last couple of moments. They remember the interactions, the last breath. Um, and uh, you could you could tell that story to other people and they're going to emotionally connect with you. But, mm -hmm. but getting it and being there is a unique yeah. thing about our group. And so... I want to give you a second to just uh, have a drink of water and collect yourself and remind people what we're doing. But I want to come back and and hear from you what advice you would give to other Jacks that are going through this. You know, they haven't they haven't walked this whole journey yet. They're still in the middle of it. And for good or for bad, you've been through the whole gamut. And so I'd love to hear what it is that you would help them with, what advice you would give. And one of the, the advice I would give is to join a group like Jack's yeah. because people get it. Um, you know, so Chris has generously put the URL back on the screen here. Go to jackscaregivercode.org, shine the light, and help folks like Mark and myself, Kyle and Justin and Dustin and Travis and Alan and Mike and you know, I'm not making these names up. These are all guys that I know and I love, and they're all bringing their, you know, their boldest self to the caregiving journey. And we want to help more Jacks. We found that one of the biggest challenges with Jacks is that people don't know about us. I would love to hear how you heard about it, and and encourage all the listeners, all of the people chatting in the window, all the people that know somebody with cancer, to get the word out so that we can help more people. So start me there, Mark. How did you hear about Jax, and what advice would you give to people that have joined our our group? Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you kind of follow along the timeline, um, 
it was a little over a year from when we first got the initial diagnosis that Terry had cancer to when I found Jax. And it's one of those things that everybody always talks about, you know, was fate, you know, there's some divine intervention of how something came about. But here I am, you know, checking Terry into one of her oncology appointments because she is, you know, even too weak to sit in the wheelchair. We had to push her in to wait in, in line. So I'm standing in line to get her checked in. And I just glance over at the table that has all the, you know, pamphlets, you know, brochures for the support groups and, and information on, you know, you know, going through this, this cancer journey. And my eyes immediately went to Jack's Caregiver Coalition on, on the list and said a caregiver group for men, you know, going through someone, a loved one with cancer. And I've probably walked by that table, you know, 50 times right. before that, that time, never even noticed that there and my eyes immediately went to that so yeah. you know in the age of smartphones now we're waiting for terry's appointment i pull up my iphone and i bring up you know the web page and start reading about it and you know i know what to say they have an event coming up in you know a week or two whatever it was and that was that that go-karting event that we, we first met at yeah. and you know I, I i went to that i was fortunate enough that terry was doing well that morning so i was able to uh to go to the event um, and you know, you talked earlier about, you know, sometimes, you know, it's hard for people to kind of understand the language of a medical diagnosis like this. Well, I knew that I was in the right group of, of, of guys because I walk in and I hear people talking about their wives, you know, hemoglobin and this and infusion <laughs> and that treatment and this pet scan is like, these people are speaking the same language that, that I'm living in right now. And. You know, I, I can't even remember who all was at that group, but everybody that was there made a point to come talk to me, welcome me to the group, ask me, you know, who I am, you know, and what brings me here. And, you know, kind of, again, give that that that, that plug for, for Jack's Caregiver Coalition is, you know, we'll, you know, tell our stories, you know, we'll cry together, and two minutes later we'll be laughing and, and, and bullshitting about, you know, something about the game or whatever it's there. The roller coaster of emotions, you know, within the group as well is just something that, you know, really only those of us who have, have gone through this battle or are in this battle, I think, can even really appreciate. Yeah, Kyle. So, yeah. Well, let me ask, which uh, Jack did you reach out to? Was it Kyle or Justin, or who did you talk to first? I reached out to Kyle first, okay. and he kind of, you know, pointed me to a couple guys, and I think it, it was just. You know, kind of one of those unfortunate timings where, you know, Mike was busy and, and um, I think Justin was, we were busy and, you know, for the, for the couple of weeks, it had a hard time connecting with, um, with anybody. But, you know, I, I communicated with, with Kyle and you know, he kept, you know, replying right back. So, and, you know, I'd, I'd gone to a couple of the events and some of the clashes and, and met some, you know, other members that way. And, yeah, it, you know, just, you know, kind of, kind of grows from there with the, uh, the, the friends that, that you make within an organization. That's great. Well, so tell me about the shirt. What's up with the Mighty Matson? So the shirt, yeah, this was um, one of the surprise fundraiser benefits that friends and a lot of Terry's coworkers in the school put together. Um, they did it all completely on their own. I mean, from I, I, I had no clue about this either until the morning of the event. But what, what they did is they went around all of Terry's coworkers, all of our friends, family. They con I, don't, I don't, still don't know how they contacted some of the people in the group. Um, but they sold through a, a, an organization here um, with Letterman Sports up in, in Blaine. They do a lot of fundraising events that way. So they printed up the T-shirts, um, sold, I think, around 100 or over 100 T-shirts. Um, and all the proceeds, you know, went went to to, uh, to Terry for paying for whatever for medical visits, food, whatever needed to get get done. But the the biggest thing that they did that, and this was one of the first fundraiser events that it, it happened pretty early on in her in her cancer journey. They picked a day at school, and like I said, my wife worked in the middle school, but it was the middle school. She would also worked in the elementary school years before. So the middle school, the elementary school, the high school all had their teachers and paras and support staff buy these T-shirts. And what they did one morning before school started, you know, they made an announcement 
you know, I said, you know, Terry walked in and they said, Terry, we need you to go to this room. We we're going to have a meeting. And, you know, first thing going through Terry's mind is, oh, crap, what's going to happen? And then all of a sudden there was an announcement that said, we need everybody to come to, you know, that same room. And she walks in there and there was 50 or uh, 75 people all wearing the Mighty Manson t-shirts. Wow. And she said that was just so overwhelming to show That's the support that she had. So and, awesome. I mean, it was, like I said, there was coworkers, friends, family, neighbors, you know, friends, my, my, of, of, you know, my kids' friends. I mean, they bought t-shirts, you know, the, the kids went to school at high school or the elementary school. And all of a sudden they start seeing people wearing a Mighty Manson t-shirt. Like, well, you know, how do you, how did, how did they even, you know, make all those connections it's, it's amazing just awesome so yeah so that was you know early on so it was always you know the mighty mats and so we've we've worn these t-shirts to a couple other events and do the breast cancer walks it's kind of kind of kind of our team name you know? that's pretty cool well i'm gonna i'm gonna do a quick little uh push forward here to talk to people about the next event yep. um and when we come back uh, i'll just give you one more chance if there's any advice you want to give to new caregivers particularly male caregivers i'd love yep. to hear what it is and as you think of that i'll just remind folks that this is episode number four i don't know how many there will be i guess we'll keep doing this as long as we can keep helping caregivers but our episode five will be brian's on and for those that haven't met Brian, boy, I look forward to introducing you to him. Uh, he is one of our younger members. And unfortunately, uh, Mark, he's, he's like you. He's, he's graduated from the caregiver role and, and mm -hmm. has a heck of a story to tell us. And then we have Chris Mulliners. And I've known Chris and Amanda now for a while. Um, and boy, he's, he's still in the middle of his caregiving journey. Um, Amanda's a lovely person. I had the pleasure of meeting her a couple times already. And I, and I look forward to hearing about him as well. Mark, I, I wished I'd gotten to meet Terry. She seems like she's a wonderful woman, great mm -hmm. mom, great person, a teacher, involved in their community, sounds wonderful. Um, I'll have to get to know her through you in future yeah. Jack's events. So as we look forward to that, what advice would you leave with new caregivers, whether they join Jack's or not? Um, is there any like just key lessons that you, you, know, you would impart on them? Yeah, I think probably the biggest thing like we uh, we discussed in, in the beginning of this is to accept the help, even if you don't think you need it. Um, you know, I, I'm, I has always kind of been that you know, mentality of, you know, I've got this, I can do it. You know, I don't need the help. And this this came about that definitely, you know, opened, opened my eyes to, you know, you know what, it, there is nothing wrong with asking and accepting help. Um, and I was fortunate enough, I had a few people tell me that early on, too. I said, you know what, take the help, you know. Yeah, you could probably, you know, run to this visit and do this and do that and still come home and mow your lawn at 9 o'clock at night. But don't. You know what, I'll mow your lawn. I'll have my son mow your lawn. You you take care of, of you. And that, I think, is, is the biggest thing is, you know, accepting the help. Um, if for nothing else, it gives you that downtime. You ask, what did I do to kind of recharge my battery? A lot of that was, you know, just taking that hour after the kids have gone to bed, Terry's gone to bed, and just sitting, you know, doing nothing, you know, whether it be whatever, just killing an hour doing absolutely nothing. That was kind of what I recharged, used to recharge. Um, and then I guess one, you know, another piece of advice I think I would have, it's really not so much for the person, you know, the caregiver, but for the person offering that help. Um, one of the things sometimes that was the hardest is when somebody says, hey, you know what? I'd love to help. What 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 do you want for dinner? Or what would you like me to do this? Like, well, by the time I figure out, you know, all of that, I could have just as well done it myself. So <laughs> it, it, it was really nice those times when someone just shows up, hey, you know what? I've got dinner. I'll be there at 530. I'll drop it off. And you know, I come home from work and the neighbor pulls up and here's your plate of lasagna or, you know, what, you know, pulled pork or sloppy joe, whatever they made. And it was just, it was nice not having to make those decisions. I mean, we've, we've all been there. We've all come home from work and, okay, well, gee, the kids are asking what's for dinner. It's like, well, I don't know. I just got home. Like, you know, half the battle sometimes is figuring out what you're going to make rather than making it. So, Great yeah, advice. you know, take that advice. And, and also for the people offering, offering the help sometimes, you know, you know, think of how you would, feel if you're in that that position you know what you know i would love it if somebody just shows up and brings me dinner or you know somebody just shows up and hey i look out the window and my neighbor's mowing my lawn for me you know like 
Well, and I, I told this story, I think, in episode two, but uh, similar, I had a buddy come over and say, um, I'm going to I'm gonna snow blow your driveway. And my driveway is 300 feet long, so it's not an insignificant thing. And I said, no, 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 I got it. Um, he's like, no, I'll do it. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, all I'm going to do is sit here and watch a Timberwolves game. And he said, good. Yep. You watch the Timberwolves game, and I'll snow blow your driveway. And, and thinking about it right now makes me emotional because you're right. Doing nothing sometimes is what you need to do. Yeah. And he knew it. He knew that I needed a break. And it, I didn't. it's not because I was going to go do the dishes or the laundry. I just needed to do nothing. Yep, just exactly. just for a little bit. And so thank you for that advice. I hope that the, the listeners Welcome. hope the listeners here get a little bit of that uh, taste of what it's like being a caregiver. <laughs> thank you for your honesty and your vulnerability. And thanks for being a member of Jax. Thanks for your time. Um, thanks to your family for giving us this time. I know that they're also waiting for dinner. Um, and so I wish nothing but the best for you and your family, and I look forward to seeing you. You bet. Yeah. Thank you, Rich. Special thanks to our producer, Chris Cloutier. Chris, thank you for all of your work in the background and for getting this published. Thanks to Kyle Woody, our executive director. He never sleeps. The guy just keeps finding more jacks and finding ways to keep them. And thanks to everybody who's involved in the jacks community. I look forward to Seeing our next guest, Mark, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you.